Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this class today. Uh, we are dealing with magnetism today, so we're going to introduce the concept. We're going to do a, uh, it's mainly going to be conceptual, although we may have some stuff later on in the homework assignment related to problems. So magnetism and electricity are basically connected to one another, and we'll see that connection later on. But in the beginning, I mean, one of the earliest phenomena that was known to basically ancients was the properties of some rocks that they do attract metals, okay? Those rocks are usually iron-based, iron-based, and they have this property which is called magnetism. There are two sides to a magnet, and this is, for most of you probably, this is a very, very familiar concept. You have played with it when you were young, and some of us still do. So basically what you have for a magnet, you have two sides to it. In this case, it's color coded to make it easy. You have on one side, the North Pole and the other side, the South Pole. And that's how we call them N and S for North and South. It doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean that they are, it's the only reason why we call them that way is because if they suspend a, a, a magnet, it's going to reorient yourself in such a way that the North points toward the North uh, which is this way, the north for me, okay? <laughs> which is points toward the north, the geographical north, that is, and uh, the south will point toward where the south is. So that's basically what why we call them North Pole and South Pole, but they are definitely of two different types. It happened that the north and the north will always repel, whereas the north and the south will always attract. So that's basically part of the properties of magnetism. Uh, the magnetic force itself is actually uh, is, is proportional also to the distance, mainly if I have two magnets that are far away, they hardly interact. But if I bring them closer, this happened to be in this case, they are opposite poles. So in this case, they are repelling stronger and stronger as I bring them closer. But if I am in here far away, there is no interaction. Same thing with the attraction. And here they are not attracting one another. But if I bring them closer, the force of, 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 uh, of uh, the uh, that is the pulling force on this case because they have opposing poles will be stronger okay so this is basically what we know about magnets this type of magnets are called permanent magnets so all of this actually all of this are magnets okay <laughs> they are all of them are magnets and uh, including this long bar in here including there is a flat one in this case which is more of a disc they even have a couple of uh, ring types of uh, magnets. There are two of them actually. And uh, the point being in here is they come in different shapes. You can make them out of different shapes. The main thing is they, uh, they have magnetic properties. If I take any of them, and I did this actually when I was young, and I was horrified when, I, when it happened. If you take any one of them and you put it under tremendous heat, it will lose its magnetism. It was a very cold night. I was in middle school and I had a magnet that I was so proud of carrying it with me everywhere. And I put it on a spoon and put it next to the fire because we needed, uh, I mean, actually we had an electrical heater. I put it next to the electrical heater and all of a sudden after the spoon warm up so much, I pulled my magnet and it was not working anymore. So that happened to be the Curie temperature. Once you reach that point, any magnet, any permanent magnet will lose its magnetism forever. You have to magnetize it again to bring it back to uh, restore its magnetic properties. And we'll try to understand all of these concepts today. We're trying to basically navigate our way through magnetism and see what is exactly as magnetism, where does it come from? Obviously, so far, we talk about uh, charges for, electric, for electricity, and we learned that the uh, charges come in positive and negative charges. And the only way for matter to acquire a negative charge, if you pile up a bunch of electrons in, uh, on it, so it becomes more negative than positive. So the net effect is that you will have a negative charge. And the only way for matter to be positively charged, honestly, is to extract as much as at least practically as much of electrons as possible. So at the end, the net effect of what is left over in this case is a positive charge. Uh, it's very hard, at least on the day, uh, on, on, on a daily experience to work with, uh, with the protons or the nucleus in this case. 
because it's it's very much anchored inside the atom. So the easiest way to do this thing is to work with electrons. So what is magnetism then? It is related to the same idea. Turns out magnetism arises from charges in motion, namely currents. So currents create magnetism. So which raises the biggest question is, where is the current in here? What is the electrical current in here? This is a magnet and you're telling me that currents create magnetism. I don't see a, a battery. I don't see a, a, a flow of charge. I'm gonna check it away. I don't see a flow of charge in here to tell me that this is kind of a, a current. So we'll try to understand that. We'll try to understand the properties of permanent magnets as opposed to another type of magnets, which are called electromagnets. Obviously in electromagnets, it generates the by electricity. That's why it's called electromagnet. You're in a current, very high current through a loop and that generates tremendous magnetic field. And the way it behaves is identical to a permanent magnet. The only difference is for an electromagnet, you can control its magnitude. If you dump a lot of current in it, so you're going to generate a very powerful magnet versus permanent magnets, which is really not easily controlled. I mean, a permanent magnet, once it's made, that's it. It retains that magnetic property. As a matter of fact, if you demagnetize it, it's going to go down. So it's very hard to control this one. So that's the biggest difference. Okay. So let me get into my notes so that we have something to write on. So again, uh, magnets, they come into two different types. There is the North Pole and South Pole. The reason we call them that way is because the North Pole points toward the North, the geographical North, okay? So this is N and this is S. And this happened to be, for example, a bar magnet, okay? So this is a bar magnet. So usually it's color coded. This is in red and this is in blue. Okay, now the color coding sometimes can be uh, actually uh, confusing a little bit. So don't pay too close attention to that. Don't even pay too close attention to uh, which one is north, which one is south. Uh, what matters in here is that they come in pairs. There is always a north and a south. You can never have a south by itself or a north by itself. And that is one of the key differences when it, when, when it comes to uh, charges. So north and south poles are always paired. You cannot isolate a bar, a uh, North Pole and a South Pole. In other words, if they take, for example, a permanent magnet, like the one I had in here, and let's say, I mean, just for the sake of argument that somebody decided to color code it right in the middle and said, this is a red and this is a blue. So you know up front that this is South and this is North, okay? Now you come in here and you cut it in two. So this is basically, the portion that was red, and it's still red in color, by the way. So what happened? You have a north in here. Guess what happened? The south in here. So the person really has to come in and erase this, uh, his colors or her colors and bring the color right in the middle. So this becomes your red and this becomes your blue. As I was saying, the color don't mean much in this case because you might be tempted saying, okay, I have a permanent magnet in here. Where is my bar magnet? I have a bar magnet in here that is red on one side and blue on the other side. So I'm gonna come and cut in here. And all of a sudden I have a red side and I have a blue side, doesn't mean much the colors. Telling you this is south, this side will remain south and this side where you meet the cutting becomes north. So that's basically, so if you really are insisting on colors then you have to recolor that thing. That's basically in a nutshell what happens. So, okay, you said, uh, well, maybe if I am lucky enough, if I cut it further more into here into the middle, I'm going to get the north by itself. No, what happened in this case, it's still. We're going to have a north on this side 
and a south on this side, no matter how much times you cut it. So you continue cutting. Still south on this side and a north on this side, you come in the middle and you cut this portion. And again, you're gonna have a north and a south, no matter how much you cut. You say, okay, I reached the level where I'm on, almost on the atomic level. So I have a very, very thin matter at the end left with. If I cut it next, what happened? I still have a magnet, I still have a North Pole and a South Pole, so I have a very small, basically, bar at the end. What happened to it if I do cut it at the end? Well, in that case, you lose completely North and South. So if you do your final cutting, you will have with two pieces in here, and there is no magnet on either of them, so you destroyed your magnet. Your magnet. So in other words, you cannot isolate the North Pole and South Pole by themselves. This is impossible. Okay, so they are always in pairs. In other words, the key word in here is there are no monopoles. And like the charges, and like charges. Charges, you have a positive charge and a negative charge, and they can be isolated. So in other words, there are mono charges, if you want to call them that way. But for the case of magnetic poles, they always pair up. They, they can never be by themselves, okay? You can never have one of them either a North Pole by itself or a South Pole by itself. It's impossible. But that is a key concept in here. It's actually a very, very important concept that the, the North and the South always come in pairs. Furthermore, the North repels repels the north, the north attracts the south, the south attracts the north, and the south repels the south. So this is part of it. So if you have a north pole, so you have to have a bar magnet in here of some sort, north-south, and if you're in a northern bar magnet with a north-south, so in this case, the forces are repelling. So they are not attracting one another. Oops. When you go away. Okay. Versus, if I, same thing if I do south on south too. It's the same phenomenon. But if I bring a north and a south, So the, this two, they attract one another. In other words, this force in this case is an attractive force. So this is the force, how the uh, magnets behave, okay? That's how they behave. The force also drops like one over distance, but it's not really one over distance. It drops with distance, let's put it this way. The power is a little bit more complicated. I mean, the, the law is a little bit more complicated. The force, The magnetic force I'm talking about in here drops with distance. In other words, far away magnets, they don't interact with one another. Close by, they do interact strongly. So if there is a repulsion, that repulsion becomes very strong. If there is an attraction, that attraction becomes very strong. So that's basically in a nutshell of bring two magnets near one another. They are far away from each other. This repulsion or that attraction becomes uh, 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 less, okay, becomes not that strong. So this is part of the properties of magnets. So this is basically what we call permanent magnets. So a bar magnet is a permanent magnet. So these are permanent magnets. It happens in nature that some elements that are either iron-based or nickel based they also do that okay i think the chrome also has some of the properties and that's basically some of the basic elements if you look at the periodic table you would see that the periodic table these elements actually they happen to be in the middle of the periodic table okay there's three elements over here in the periodic table you have iron 
you have cobalt and you have nickel. Did you say cobalt or chromium? I'm sorry, it's cobalt, okay? So those are the, the elements that do have that. Let me change the camera, let me stop sharing quickly. So if you don't have that, I mean, I know in our lab, we have a big uh, periodic table in there. So we have an iron, cobalt, and nickel. Those are some of the elements that do have that on their own, but compounds also do. Compounds also have, uh, have, uh, have magnetic properties, okay? And magnetic pro magnetism itself has so many properties that it's not uh, restricted only to the ones that retain their magnetism after you lift the uh, magnetization agent. Those are called ferromagnets. Ferromagnets, because the word ferro means iron, basically. Bad magnets. So this is a very strong magnet, actually, that is a mixture of different elements. And so this is a very, very strong. It has this protective uh, layer in here but because it comes apart. And it's very strong. <laughs> so the point being in here is that uh, magnetic materials, they come in different uh, different, actually different origins. We're used really, I, honestly, to mainly iron. So that's really the biggest one in here, okay? But because iron and nickel, they have a very big concentration in the earth. So the earth actually behaves, at least in its core, behaves as a big bar magnet, really. So uh, the earth has a core that is molten core, I mean, I'm not talking about the outer layer, so I'm a terrible picture of the Earth. It looks horrible because I'm trying to contain the word molten. Okay. It's still not any great, okay? So you have a core in here that is really mainly iron and nickel, and it's extremely hot, okay? Molten, actually. And the Earth is spinning around its own axis, and as it does spin in this case, you have charges in motion, as I was saying in the introduction, uh, that is what creates magnetism. So you have the north and the south of the Earth. So these are the geographical north and the geographical south. Okay? The north magnetic field or the, or the magnetic field, there is actually a difference of about a few kilometers between the two, between the geographical north and the actual uh, magnetic pole. And the same thing between the geographical south and the magnetic pole in that region. The reason why I'm calling them magnetic poles is because that's actually where the uh, north magnetic pole is located here, and the south magnetic pole is located here. But uh, that's a really irrelevant details. So the magnetic field lines for the Earth look like this. And I just introduced a concept without really explaining much about it, and we're going to talk about it. So if you take a needle, which is something similar to the one I had last time, you can see now. Yeah, this piece, did I misprint that? No, no, it's not. So basically, if you have a magnetic uh, compass, okay, and you have the needle pointing toward the north and you move with it. So if you are on the earth and you can fly somehow, or uh, so the magnetic needle will always point in this direction to the north. And if you follow this line of the same strength, actually, you describe a curve that looks like this. It's always tangent, of course, to the direction. So I'm gonna just draw the arrows from this point on. So if you connect the arrows, that's going to describe what is a field line. So the magnetic field line and this is true for all lines, by the way. If you, uh, that's what we're probably going to do today in the lab. If you have an iron filings, basically, which is uh, pieces of iron, okay, fine iron, and then you put it on a piece of paper, and then you bring a magnet underneath. So what happened in this case, the distribution of the iron filing will follow the magnetic field lines. So the magnetic field line is, the line, drawn by moving a magnetic needle from North Pole from North to South Pole. 
Okay, so that's basically what the field line is. If you take a magnetic needle, which is a compass, and you move it around, it's going to point on the same direction. As long as you maintain the same strength, really, that is a magnetic field line. If you move away, as I was saying, the distance drops, so the magnetic field in this point is weaker than a magnetic field in this point. So the needle will respond, but not as strong as in here, okay? So the effects of the distance plays a role. So if I take a bar magnet now, this is where the north is and this is where the south is. So the magnetic field line would look like this. It leaves the north pole and terminates in the south pole. As a matter of fact, it doesn't terminate. It's going to come out on the other side too. Same thing, if you take this line, it's going to continue on this side in here. And there is another one symmetrical to it like this. If you take this line in here, it's going to go around the galaxy and come back from the other side to the South Pole. So that's basically in a nutshell what the field lines is. So this one would travel very far before it terminates into the South Pole. It doesn't terminate actually, it's going to go as I was saying inside the bar magnet too. So this one also will leave the bar magnet and come from the other side. So magnetic field, lines loop around magnetic field lines loop around the north and south poles. Obviously, the, the closer you are from there, the denser they appear. The further away, the less sparse they are because they have to travel big distances to come back. And that is really another indication of the strength of the magnetic field. So the denser the field lines, the closer they are by themselves, uh, from one another, actually, that's what that means. The denser the field lines, the stronger magnetic field. So this is in a nutshell how magnets work. And this is all of the talk is about bar magnets. Mr. Ampere did experiments actually. And this experiments led to the following. If you take a wire and you run a current through it, so there is a current flowing in a wire. What happened in this case is going to create a magnetic field. And the magnetic field will come from the screen, goes around, and goes around the other side and come back. Again, it's going to loop around the wire at any given point. And if you are here, it's the same thing. It's going to come from the screen, goes around, and go into the screen and come back from the other side. So this is where the magnetic field line look like. So these are the field lines in this case. So the bottom line is, according to Mr. Ampere's law, Ampere currents, I mean, if you kill the current, how do I know that? You're saying, okay, how do I know all of this? Bring a needle, okay? Compass, next to, next to, that's what we're gonna do today in the lab. Put it next to the wire and run the current through it. Close the, battery, or close the, uh, the circuit, meaning, uh, turn on the switch. When you turn on the switch, the current start running and you will see the needle immediately respond. So current create a magnetic field. Kill the current and the magnetic field is gone and the needle goes back to point where the earth is pointing. So current creates, current creates a magnetic field. How do I know the direction in here? I know I told you the compass, that's one way, but the direction is given by the right-hand rule. The direction of the field line are given by the right-hand rule, RHR. Okay, you take your hand, the right hand, not the left one, the right one, okay? 
and you point your thumb to where the current is going. So in my case in here, in the previous picture, the current was going this way. So the, the, the way the, the rest of your fingers, the rest of the hand basically curves around that thumb is the direction of the magnetic field. So that's the right hand rule. So in this case, I take the hand, let's try to draw a hand in here. So this is the thumb and the way the other fingers wrap themselves around, that is the direction of the magnetic field. So this is magnetic field. Usually the symbol for the magnetic field is B and the symbol for the current is I. So this is the current I and that is where the B field is. So if in the case, for example, the current was running in the opposite direction, if the current was up, going around this way, then the picture reverses. So if I do this, then the, it's going to curl around. So in this case, the magnetic field will come out of the screen in here and goes around and into the screen in here and wraps itself around it. And that's the direction of the magnetic field the way it's going to look if the current is going this way. So basically it's going to be in the opposite direction than this one. So that's basically the first indication that the magnetic field is related to the current. So if you create a current, by the way, basically what you're doing, you're creating an electric field. Because the way that it works, again, we talked about this last time when we were doing electricity, you have charges inside the, the, the conductor. So this is basically the same wire in here I'm looking at, except I'm looking at up close now. So I have charges in a regular conductor like copper, for example, electrons that are basically going every which way. So when you connect the battery in this case, So when you connect the battery and you turn on the switch, so what happened in this case, there is, a, there, is, there is a voltage difference between the two areas and the voltage is related to the electric field. So there is an electric field now that is going to push the charges in one direction and one direction only, okay? So this is the electric field that is generated. So the electric field, in a sense, is the one that creates the magnetic field. So once the electric field basically starts in action and pushes the charges, so a magnetic field now will be generated. So this is the magnetic field. Okay, some of you, especially who read a lot about this topic, might be saying, okay, if the electric field in here is this way, and these charges are negatively charged because they are electrons in which is just there. Shouldn't the electrons be moving this way? And that's true. That is actually exactly what you're saying, what we're saying. Because this is the negative pole of the battery. And this is the positive pole of the battery. So the charges, namely the electrons, will be attracted toward the positive pole and they will be repelled by the negative pole. So they are going to be pushed by the battery this way, come in here. The minute they fall in here to the positive charge, the battery doesn't matter how big it is, if it's 12 volt battery, for example, is going to push them down to where they don't want to be, namely to the south pole, to the south uh, terminal of the battery. And then at that point, again, they're going to find that as long as this switch is closed, they will go around. And that is no problem. That is actually true. And that is because we, by, by accident, gave the uh, electrons a negative charge whereas it should really have been labeled a positive charge, in which case the proton would be negative, but that's fine. I mean, the current is where a positive charge would be moving this way. And since the negative charge is moving this way, it's as if a positive charge is moving in the opposite direction and goes to it. So that's not the problem. The problem is that the electric field in this case, which is responsible for this motion of the electrons, which is a current that is generated in the wire, is the one that creates the magnetic field. So if I bring a compass in here, the compass will point to this direction and will follow in this direction. So the magnetic field is created. Granted, for weak magnetic field, for weak currents, we don't really have a strong magnetic field, but that's in a nutshell what that is. Okay. So you really have to have strong currents to really see this effect as well. Okay, I'm not going to do this experiment today in the lab. So this is Ampere's law. So the bottom line is currents create magnetic field. And then here is the thing. What happens if I bring a bar magnet close by? So I have a wire that has a current and I have a bar magnet in it. Well, they interact in this case, if this is the north 
this way, and the south is this way, and if I point the north in here, well, they're gonna repel. If I flip the magnet, they're gonna attract. So there is no mystery in here. Again, this wire behaves just as if it's a normal, uh, normal uh, magnet now as long as there is current in it. But if I kill it, that's it, it's gone, okay? I, I don't know if you guys remember the lab we did uh, on the free fall several weeks ago. It was before the, uh, I think around the exam, exam one that is. Uh, if you guys remember what you had, you had, a, you had a, a mass that is made out of an iron basically that you suspend. You turn on the switch, now it's held by an electromagnet. So that's a current that creates a magnetic field and hold it in space. Part of the challenge is to make sure it doesn't wobble so that when it falls, it falls straight through. So when you cut the current, the magnetic field is killed and then that iron basically has no reason to stay attached to the, uh, to the electromagnet. There is no magnetism anymore, so it's going to fall. That's how you recorded your, your lab. So uh, this concept was used in the free lab, in the free fall lab. Okay, so we had, if you guys remember, we had a, an end in here, actually it was a little bit sharper, and then we brought a, ma a mass in this case and we suspend it after we turn on the current in here, okay? So there is a current that is flowing in here. So there is a switch at some point that you turn that in. So after you turn on the switch, at that kind of time, it stays suspended. So there is a place where this thing falls and it records the timing and each firing is one sixtieth of a second and so on and so forth. You guys remember that lab. So the point being in here is at this point, it's suspended. Once you kill the switch, that's it. This thing starts falling, free fall, okay? So that was the lab we did several weeks ago. And that is based on this concept that current in this case generally creates an electromagnet. And that electromagnet was responsible for holding that mass suspended. And if you guys remember that mass was high, it was heavy, which means that you really require a big uh, magnetic force in this case to hold it in place to overcome the force of gravity. So, uh, so this concept is there and it's always, and it's, and it's called Ampere's law. So cre currents create a magnetic field. So that's basically in a nutshell what that is. Also, magnetic field creates currents. That's a strange thing in here too. Faraday's law suggests that currents create a magnetic, I mean, magnetic fields, time varying magnetic fields. Time varying magnetic fields create currents. Let me try to demonstrate this one in here for you guys. What I have in here, I have a loop, which is basically a bunch of wires. I was trying to use actually this one for another experiment somewhere else. And the loop is attached to this probes. So I'm gonna make sure that it's attached because if it's not attached, at least the exposed end of this wire has to be attached and this one has to be attached both sides. So can the, no oh man, came off. That's the trouble with doing this. I mean, without the, I'm not planning to have this one permanent. So that's why I'm not trying to uh, have it. In the and the probes are actually part of a multimeter and the multimeter now is here. Okay, so let me turn off the sharing quickly to see if I can demo this. So I have a multimeter in here, which I'm going to turn on all the way to the micro microcurrent. So there is no current in here right now. So I'm going to take a bar magnet, doesn't matter which. Where is the other one? That's in there. That wire, which is hard to. Okay, so I have this bar magnet in here. And right now I'm going to put it next to the uh, to the uh, to the current to the wire, and nothing happens. But if I start moving it in and out, okay, if I can get it to connect first of all, because, oh man, okay. oh 
hard to demonstrate this <laughs> because they have to get the magnet out of the way in here. Uh, it's affecting everything now. You see the current that is forming now because I am bringing it in and out. But if I put it next to it only and don't move it, right now because my shaking hand is shaking, but right now it's zero. But the minute I move it in and out of the circuit, it's going to show me a current that I'm, I'm reading in here. Okay, it's very hard to do this because I'm by myself right now. But basically what I was doing is I was moving the bar magnet into in and out of this, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this loop that I have formed in here. Okay, let me see, as long as there is a connection, which I hope there is, so let me see if I can demo it now in here, if I can isolate this magnet. But it's, oh man, they're refusing to detach. See right now, if I put it next to it, there is nothing. But if I move it in and out, that means the magnetic field that is created, the field lines that it created in here are either increasing or decreasing when I move them around the, uh, around the loop. But if I have it fixed, it's not moving, I should have a zero current. But if I move it, there is no battery. Here's the thing, there's absolutely no battery. There should not be a current that I read by the multimeter at all. Yet, if I have a magnet moving in and out, I have current as if I have a battery for that, as if I have this one in here. Obviously, this one will not do anything. Okay, <laughs> so it has to be the other way around. So it has to be a current, a magnetic field, and that magnetic field has to change with time. It has to be a time varying magnetic field. So not any magnetic field will do. The magnetic field has to change with time. So that's what the law is. So let me go back into the screen in here. Shall we? You? So a time uh, a time varying magnetic field creates a magnet. It creates a current. That's what that means. Okay. As long as you can do that, you're fine. So let me let me draw the experiment. At least I did right now. So I have a bunch of loops, and the reason why I have a bunch of loops is really simple because I really want to cut that wire because I was trying to use it for another purpose. Okay. So if I have a wire in here, so this is a single wire. And if I bring a magnet, it doesn't matter which side you're facing, either north, south, or south, north, it doesn't matter. And in this case, what I have in here, I have a multimeter. So basically a device to measure the currents, okay? So the multimeter is reads zero current if there is no, if the magnet is sitting still and the wire is sitting still. But what happened is when I start moving the wire in and out, then the field lines that are penetrating this magnetic, this, uh, this, uh, this loop, let me blow it to let that move. So this is how the loop looks like, okay? Obviously you cannot make a real loop loop because then the current has to go somewhere, okay? Okay, let's make a theoretical loop, okay? Let's close it completely and have a, a meter, okay? Multimeter, let me turn it up. I had it uh, turned into uh, the microamp, so it was working as a as a as a as an ammeter, basically measuring currents. Okay. Now, if I have a magnet in here next to it, and let's say, for example, I count one, two, three, four field lines. The fifth one is going this way, and the other one is going this way. So there are only four field lines coming in. They bring it closer, this one will move inside. So this is the new position of this one. Obviously, the others will have moved closer. Now I have increased the field lines. If I move it away, then this one that was in will be out. So it really has to do with how many field lines are cutting that, 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 uh, that loop, that's all. And if you do, the current will move this way or that way. That's why you were seeing positive and negative signs, depending on which way is the field. Are the field lines increasing or are the field lines decreasing? That determines the direction of the current. Is the current flowing counterclockwise or the current flowing clockwise? So that basically uh, clockwise is the opposite direction. Okay, so that is really the the whole story. So changing magnetic field with time will create a magnetic field. So this is called the law of induction, Faraday's law, Faraday Lenz law, because Lenz contributed the negative sign to Bohr's law. So changing 
changing, the flow of magnetic field lines, and that word has a word name, by the way, the flow of magnetic field lines, basically increasing them or uh, reducing them. This word is called the flux. So if you heard the flux, that's what we mean by it. The number of field lines that are going in and the number of field lines that are coming out, basically that's what the flux is, okay? So changing the flow of magnetic field lines inside the loop an electrical loop, a wire basically, a loop of a conducting material This wire that I'm using right now is actually has a high gauge. It's, it's, I mean, it looks kind of thin, but it's not thin enough, honestly, for this purpose. And uh, this is the smallest one I could get from Home Depot. You go to Home Depot, just when you go to the entrance on the side of the, uh, the middle side, I remember, I don't know if, uh, how your Home Depot looks like, but the one at least here in San Bernardino has three entrances, one next to the garden and the one next to it. Immediately on the on the shelves there, there is a place where you can ask them to cut wires for you. So this wire happened to be actually of a higher gauge wire. I mean, relatively speaking, because there, uh, 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 this is the smallest gauge I could get basically the, the uh, I know the gauges work backwards. So if you say smallest, that number is actually high <laughs> for the wire. And versus if you ask for a high, uh, for a thicker wire, they give you a small gauge wire. Okay, so that's how gauges work. And uh, so this is actually a higher number gauge, meaning it's a thinner wire, but this is the thinnest that they have in Home Depot. And if you happen to, uh, if you need thinner, because for the applications that we really do sometimes, like for example, this is another concept that we're going to get into. This gauge is a lot smaller than that one. So I, I just said it again. This wire is a lot thinner, meaning that the gauge is higher. Okay. So these are technical things that are relevant for this purpose here, but we really need the smaller wire, the thinner wire for practical purposes, because then the, this will be more sensitive to uh, to changes in the flow of uh, magnetic field to create basically uh, strong currents or less currents. This is important, actually. This is not something to, uh, I mean, even on a daily experience, probably if you have a car, you have an alternator in the car, and sometimes the alternator, especially with the old cars that are not fully integrated, not all of the electronics basically integrated, the alternator can go bad. So you go to a place that takes alternators, and there is one actually not too far from campus. There is one actually I know not too far from campus, probably about half a block from uh, the campus. So that actually you have a lot thinner wire and they have, they rebuild actually alternators because what the alternators are, are a bunch of wires that trap around mag magnets so that when the, when the car is moving, that spins and that creates currents basically to recharge the battery of the car. So that's basically what that is. So what you would want the battery to be on next time when you turn on the car, at least to be charged, that you should say. So again, they usually use a higher gauge, meaning thinner wires for that purpose. And of course, the gauge I was showing you is a little bit thicker than, than what it should be, but that's the smallest I could get because they have electrical applications, not electronic applications for uh, in the store that I went to. Anyway, so let's go back to the notes. The point being in here is that Changing the field, the flow of the magnetic field lines, which the word is called flux, inside the loop of a conducting material. So this material is copper, and that's the one that you're going to find everywhere. Okay, you're going to find uh, wires made out of gold unless you're trying to build another James Webb or something. Okay, so a loop of a conducting material creates currents. And then the reason why it creates a current is because of the fact that they are loop. If it's not a loop, here is what happened. It creates actually a, an electromotive force field. It creates a voltage. So if the loop looked like this, not closed, okay? 
So the charges in this case will not complete the circuit. They will not, I mean, if you put an M meter in here, it still stays on zero, it's not gonna move. But the voltmeter in here will read a value. Voltmeter, if you terminate it in here, will have a value. It will show you that there is a voltage in here difference. So there are charges that pile up in here negative and the charges that are depleted in here that are positive, and there is actually an electric field that is going to be created. So the loop will have current. So if you put an M meter in there, it's going to read current, just like I did. You will have a current flowing through the circuit. So there is no question about it. But <clears throat> if you put the terminals in such a way that they are free, you don't have them completely connecting. So it's not a loop anymore. Then in that case, you will create a a positive terminal and a negative terminal, similar to what the battery is. And that's how power is generated. This is how power is generated. I mean, basically, so if you go to the Hoover Dam or any dam that generates electricity, or if you go to, if you have one of those that are basically using a, a, a diesel, for example, or gasoline or whatever you have in your, in your disposal. So basically what they do in this case, they, the way they work is they have either a loop that uh, turns or they have a magnet that turns with a loop fixed. So you have one thing or the other. So you have a bar magnet that is fixed. This is usually not the case, at least in practical applications. So you have a bar magnet that of course is gonna loop around and that's forget about that for right now. So you have a north on one end and you have a south on the other. And in this case, what's going on in here, the field line look like this. It leaves the North Pole and comes and terminates the South Pole. So these are a bunch of field lines that are going to leave the North Pole and terminate in the South Pole. So what you do in this case in here is you will have a, uh, a loop. Of course, one is not enough, honestly. Let's make it a little bit more. So one is not enough. In here, and you rotate it. And as it rotates, the field lines that are penetrating will change with time. So it's the same effect as if you're moving the bar magnet. So really it's not the bar magnet that need to move. You could put the bar magnet sitting still and have the loop in and out. And that's exactly what's going on in this case. You have the loop that is spinning and as it's spinning, more field lines will go in. And at sometimes when it's completely parallel to the field lines, there is no field line coming in and then it's going to switch. And the current that is going to be generated is going to be an alternating current. This is an alternating current. That's why the power companies, they generate uh, uh, alternative currents. Obviously the devices that you have at home, they don't use AC currents, they use uh, uh, DC currents. So they have to have a converter in there at some point. They have to have a something that converts from AC to DC. So that's basically how power is generated. That's the principle of of course, in the turbines, in the in the power generation places, they usually have the magnet that they're spinning, and they have the wire, the the, the big loop that is sitting still. And in the same case, you're going to produce the same thing. So I have the, they actually have this picture. Okay. And for the case of your bicycle, if you have a dynamo, that's how the principle also works for the bicycle, the ones that generate. Uh, that's how the electricity is basically so that you light your uh, light bulb, okay? And that's how you do it. So that's how you build electricity. Obviously at this point, you don't create a current necessarily unless you close the loop. But you put, a, for example, a light bulb in here, obviously in here, there's a problem. How are we going to generate this one that is moving into that? So what they do, they have brushes in here that are in touch with this spinning uh, uh, contacts. So at some point they're, they are actually made out of uh, uh, materials that are super thin. So basically, they 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 touch the uh, the, the wire, and then when 
one of them freeze goes to the other one. So in here, in order to, to get this, for example, a light bulb in here attached, And if this is spinning fast enough, of course, you're going to have electricity. Okay, you have the light bulb you turn on. Okay, but if it's not attached to a circuit that is closed, then what you're doing in this case, you're building a voltage. You're creating a battery. You have a positive terminal and negative terminal. And if you want energy off of it, plug in a device. The same thing in here, the power company delivers for you a, a, a voltage. So it doesn't deliver to current necessarily. I mean, unless you plug a device, then you will have a current. That's when you pay. But you don't pay if you just have a voltage sitting instead. But they continuously create that voltage for your consumption. So that is basically how currents are made okay, using Faraday lens law. I mean, the lens is part of it is coming actually from the sign which way the current will flow. But that's irrelevant for right now. What matters is actually the the uh, what matters in this case is actually the fact that you're generating this this current using the time varying magnetic field okay okay so there is only another point that i really want to emphasize on at this point and i know we're going to come back on uh, uh we're going to have more discussion honestly in the lab today so that's why i'm not really too uh, worried about it i mean one of the discussions we're going to have in the lab and that's why i probably didn't mention it and I will not really emphasize on it because we're going to have the discussion more in depth today. So you take two wires and you run a current through them. So if the two currents are in the same direction, the two wires will create each and every one of them magnetic field. And now what you have in this case, you have a charge or you have a current that is inside a magnetic field and it's going to behave exactly in the same the, the other fashion. So it's going to be repelled. So two wires running currents in the same direction will repel each other. So currents in the same direction repel. Whereas currents in opposite directions attract. So if you have a wire running current this way and another wire running current that way, those they will attract one another. So currents in two wires in opposite direction, attract one another. So the other thing that we're going to talk about also in the lab is that if you have a charge next to a magnet, so let's say, for example, you have a magnet in here, it has to be strong enough to have this effect visible, and you have a charge in here. And if the charge is not moving, nothing happens. Okay. But if the charge is all of a sudden moving, with a velocity V, then in this case, it's going to be subject to a force. So if the field line, for example, is pointing this way, and the force, if the Q is positive, the charge is positive. The charge will come out of the screen. If the Q is negative, the charge will go further into the screen. So the force is perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. Its direction, the direction of the force that is, its direction is given by the right hand rule. Except in this case, I have to be careful. If this is V and this is B, then the direction of the magnetic field is along. So basically you have to use your right hand. You cannot use your left hand. So you're gonna use the thumb. You're gonna use the pointer. I don't know what it's called. I think that's what's its name. And then you have to use your uh, the middle. So in this case, that's how basically 
they, they go. So V, B, and the false F. Now, provided that Q is positive. If Q is negative, everything, the force will flip its side, okay? For a positive. So the right, the, I know I mentioned the other right hand rule earlier, where you use the right hand, where you curl the current around the, uh, where you curl your palm around the, or the rest of the fingers around the thumb. Then in this case, it gives you direction of the magnetic field. This one is slightly different. So this one, again, this is the thumb. That is where the velocity is. And this is where the, uh, the pointer is. So this is where the magnetic field is. And the way that this is basically works is in this case, so the other two fingers are basically wrapped around, so you don't, we don't need them for this purpose. So this is where the force is, okay, provided Q is positive. If Q is negative, you're going to reverse the direction of F. The force is gonna be in here. So that is where F, F could, obviously you cannot break your finger and put it that way, but once you find it for positive, just take the, the opposite direction to find where the negative is. And the force in this case is proportional to, the force in this case is proportional to the charge, the velocity, the magnetic field, and the sign of the angle between the velocity and the, and the, and the, and the magnetic field. But for our case, we're going to take it 90 degrees. The sign of 90 degrees is one. So we're going to take them perpendicular. For all practical purposes, it's QVB. Okay, so where Q is the charge, V is the velocity, and B is the strength of the magnetic field in Tesla. That's the unit for the magnetic field. The magnetic field unit is Tesla, and uh, Tesla is honestly not a fundamental unit. It's actually, which is Tesla, and a Tesla is one Newton per Coulomb per meter per second. Coulomb per second is an ampere. Coulomb over second is an ampere. So this is a Newton per ampere per meter. So Tesla, one Tesla is one Newton, which is a kilogram meter per second squared divided by an ampere. So you can convert everything into a uh, divided by meter also. So it's a one kilogram ampere second squared. Well, in this case, that's in, but it's in honor of Mr. Tesla, who did a lot of stuff in this area. We called it the te Tesla. Tesla is a big magnetic field, okay? One Tesla is big. One Tesla is a big magnetic field. We use the Gauss instead. Okay, Earth's magnetic field is 0.5 uh, Gauss, instead of saying, uh, what is it? Uh, five times 10 to the negative five, we just say it's 0.5 Gauss, okay? So that is really the uh, the unit that is used day to day. But the way, by the way, Gauss is not really the the uh, uh, the proper unit that we should use. We should use the Tesla. So uh, stick with the Tesla. All the be it the magnetic field values will be very very tiny for all of the uh, applications that we will be doing. But at least that's the SI unit, so that you never go wrong with it. So don't worry about the Gauss too much. Okay, Gauss is actually a practical unit because. The number actually will be in a, in a manageable fashion. You don't have powers 10 to the negative 7, 10 to the negative, those, those things to deal with. So they're all consumed inside the house. Okay. Uh, so these are the key things for this unit that I really wanted to talk about. There is another point in here, and that's what we're going to close with. And that is the magnetic domains, because I mentioned earlier that the cause of the, according to Ampere's law, Currents create magnetic field, and according to actually uh, Faraday's law, it's the opposite. Time varying magnetic field create current. So there is a kind of a connection between the two. So let me draw that, and I'm going to talk about the exam also. Let me uh, talk about that first, okay? The magnetic field, okay? The magnetic domains. 
And this is the question I started with honestly, okay? So what's going on inside the material like this bar magnet in here? This bar magnet in here. So where is the current? I know when I demoed the other one, it's actually the opposite, but Ampere law says that the currents create magnetic fields. So where is the current in here? So that's the question. If you take this one, and you look at it with a very, very, very very powerful microscope, like an electron microscope, you will see it that it's made up of regions of space that are called domains, okay? Each region is its own, has its own properties, okay? So, and you look for the atoms in this region, and I'm going to zoom into a small region of that. So this is how the atoms look like. You have one atom in here, you have another atom next to it. I'm just looking at the outer shells, okay? I'm not looking at the inner shells of this, this atoms. So basically the electrons at the outside, I don't care about the protons, I don't care about the inner electrons other than the ones that do chemistry, okay? So this electron is moving this way, this electron is moving this way, this electron is moving that way. So the, I chose this whole region to be too tiny, made up in this case of nine, nine, nine atoms. So they will have homogeneity and they will be actually interacting with one another. So all of the electrons that they chose them, they are moving counterclockwise in the positive direction. That's what counterclockwise is. So each and every one of them has a current flowing in the positive direction. So is this one, by the way, okay, which is the innermost, okay. So in this case, let's look at this point in here, this intersection in here, okay? I have a, from this atom, I have an electron that is moving this way, and I have an electron that is moving this way, so the two cancel, because they're moving in opposite direction. So there is no net motion of charges in here. So is this one, this electron is coming down, this one is going up, and they cancel in this, where they meet. The same thing, they cancel in here. They cancel in here, this one is actually going, counterclockwise, this one also is going counterclockwise, but this is going to my right, and this one is going to my left, and they cancel where they meet. Same thing, they cancel everywhere I choose them. Even the, the inner one doesn't contribute at all. For this case, this atom has this electron going to the left, and its electron is going to the right, so it cancels in here. This one is going up, this one is coming down, it cancels in here. This one is going to the left, this one is going to the right, they cancel in here. This one is coming down for this atom. This one is going up for that atom. So they cancel in here. So this atom, the innermost one doesn't contribute whatsoever, okay? And the net motion. But this one in here in the net motion as if I have a charge, let me draw it with a different color. So if I go from this atom in here and jump into the next one as if I have a charge that is continuously moving in the positive direction, counterclockwise, okay? So this region of space looks like it's a loop. The one I was talking about earlier. <laughs> looks like a loop of a current, okay? That's it. So that is basically how this region on the, on, 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 on the a smaller scale would look like. On a bigger scale, the entire region looks like it's a loop and it's creating a magnetic field. Let's say, for example, in this direction. This one is creating it probably here. This one is creating it that way. And this one is creating it this way. Obviously, I chose these directions so that they cancel. That's most of the materials. Most of the materials. Do not. Have magnetic properties. That's why if you take, for example, any kind of other substance like carbon, for example, and you magnetize it, you may have some temporary behavior with magnetism, but then, and there is on, not only ferromagnets, there is a paramagnetism, there is diamagnetism, there are all kinds of other properties that are actually too much to to actually uh, talk about at this point. But the point being in here, they can have some magnetic temperature proper, uh, I mean, uh, temporarily, but then when you lift the magnetic force, uh, the magnetic field, that's it. They go back to their normal state. The ferromagnets though, like iron and nickel and cobalt, 
they have this property when you lift the magnetic field, this region of space that was oriented in one way and the other one that was oriented in this way, for example, and this one in here, and I'm gonna take one more in here. So this one probably aligned itself more or less with the external agent. This one aligned with itself, this one is aligned, and this one has, a, so most of them now are aligned in one direction. So this will become your north and this will become your south. So, so when you remove the, the agent that caused the, the regions to be aligned, they retain their alignment. How do they do it? Well, this region now has this direction and it's pushing this one in the same direction. And this one is in this direction and it's helping this one also to stay in. So they lean on each other in a self-consistent fashion so that after you remove the agent that caused them to be magnetized, they retain their magnetism. So material, some materials they retain their magnetism when they have their different regions. By the way, this is called the domain, magnetic domain. So the magnetic domains now retain their magnetization. So magnetic domains retain their uh, directions after you remove the magnetization. The magnetization in the story. I mean, it's caused by an electromagnet or thermal 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 or other, other pro whatever other process has caused it to begin with. Okay. Uh, so, again, we're going to come back a little bit down the road, actually, because we have next week, we don't have lab, we have actually a discussion session. So we're going to talk about some of the problems involving electricity and magnetism, and hopefully we'll get into more details. Today, the lab is going to be on magnetism, so we're going to have more details on these things. Uh, for a word for the, for the exam. I know we have the review, and the review is due actually tomorrow, by Thursday, I mean by uh, Tuesday, tomorrow. So I'm hoping that all of you will finish it by then, okay? And... Uh, uh, complete it so that you get your full credit for it. The exam is actually on this Wednesday, so we will not have a live session this Wednesday, and it's all for this exam. So hopefully you guys will do the conceptual exam, which is this Wednesday. Now, this is going to be 85% of your grade for this exam. The 15% is coming from the second portion of the exam, which will be open on Thursday at 8 o'clock in the morning and will be available for the entire day of Thursday and the entire day of uh, Friday. And that is actually going to be uh, 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 the, uh, the written version of the exam. So you're going to take a picture of your work and you're going to upload it to Canvas or you could work in Word and upload it to, uh, to, uh, to Canvas. The grading is actually in, in, in there. You will have three problems. There's gonna be, uh, I think, I, I think I said it to 45 minutes because I included about 15 minutes for you guys to upload your work. And then, uh, oh no, no, I think 40, yeah, 45 minutes. So that you upload your work and that way you will have, you'll be done with your exam, okay? So this is basically the last thing that I had in mind to talk about namely for the exam. And if you guys have any questions or if you're struggling with something, please let me know. And uh, this, this week we will have a lab, of course. Next week we're going to be dedicated to a discussion session related to all of the problems and the concepts that I've covered so far. Thank you.